climate change plays in is that you know we can't really depend on the past as a guide to what to expect in the future, right? I don't know right now um, that, that we can point to any particular thing that has happened as a result of climate change related to water, but I think the overall, the next couple of decades going to be critical for us and, and interesting, but probably not interesting in a very satisfactory way. It's, it's, it's quite scary and what, what fascinates me, I guess, is um, how the upper and lower basins, the states, um, will be or are going to deal with um, with climate change and the impacts on flow in the river. The drought contingency plans, to me, um, I'm not sure that they're acknowledging you know, the full extent of what could happen. The uh, um, global circulation models, the ensemble models that that are looked at um, the Four Corners area and, and in, in particularly San Juan County and Grand County, Utah, we're already at two degrees C above pre-industrial. So we're going into a, a situations right now in our parks where the historical record, we're in the 98th, 99th percentile of that record for say, mean warmest temperatures over a month, warmest minimum temperatures over a month. So, you know, the difference between now and what the tree ring data can tell us is that we're in an unexplored environment for um, CO2 in the atmosphere and so on that, that, that you know, we really haven't experienced in quite a few million years. You know, we have we have, local, we have local and regional climate impact because we're not a headwaters area, right? So the headwaters are up in Wyoming and Colorado for the basin. So they can have a great, well, probably nobody has a great snow year anymore, but a reasonable snow year. But we can be in drought down here. So that means that a local storm here that affects Courthouse Wash or the Dirty Devil River, whatever, um, isn't going to have a lot of effect on what we want to see as far as ecosystem change or ecosystem maintenance or return to rest restoration to health in the Colorado and the Green River main stem. They can have some local effects, of course. And what we're interested in with, say, the changes that we, we do not want to see on the river and the changes that we are would like to prevent is long-term um, reduction in flow that has a, a negative effect on ecosystem function, whether that's teeny species or riparian um, communities, cottonwood galleries, those kinds of things. And I, I don't know that we can really prevent that, but we need to be able to mitigate to the best of our abilities. Um, you know, there are no real solutions, right? We just have to make the best choices that we can with the the flows that we get and try and work with Reclamation and other partners on um, keeping as many big flow events in the river as we can get. In the last 20 years, we have seen in Canyonlands and other, other reaches on, on both the Green and the Colorado is that um, channel narrowing and channel simplification because we don't get the massive 50, 60,000 CFS flows anymore. It would tend to, to take out uh, riparian vegetation and, um, and increase the width of the river. My fear is that as flows diminish as a result of climate change that we will, can, we will see worsening narrowing, worsening channel simplification because we'll, we won't be getting the volumes of water necessary to really move a lot of sediment and, and be dynamic in the sediment thing. And this is going to be probably probably a gradual change, but um, I don't know and I wonder, you know, if this is going to be more episodic or more punctuated than gradual. So over the last 30 to 50 years, the sediment supply, sediment inputs into the main stem Green in Colorado has actually declined somewhat, but 
we're not sure why. And so we have a situation where we have overall less sediment coming into the rivers from the big basins, but then episodic inputs from smaller tributaries. So we are looking at climate change uh, and what the potential effects of climate change will be on our vegetation community. Uh, and you know, broadly defined grasslands, shrublands, and then painted juniper woodlands. Um, what, say, what grasses or what shrubs do we expect will be favored in under what condition? If you have a, a transfer from primarily winter precipitation to more monsoon precipitation, does that favor certain species over others? Um, and do we have some species that may be, can be fairly well adapted or could be induced to be adapted to warmer conditions, more arid conditions. But we also then have um, plant species have limited ability to respond and change to you know, more arid conditions. We're seeing um, spotty, but large areas or um, say of um, pinyon juniper stress and die off. And it's not always huge, continuous areas, but it seems to be widespread. You know, see huge areas where um, juniper has been really stressed in the last couple of years. So it's really, it seems quite spotty, but fairly widespread. Um, sort of the final thought on the river, sort of what we're trying to do is make, is, I can kind of think of this, here's the, with all this research we're doing on, on river flow and sediment dynamics and transport and the riparian system and cottonwood versus tamarisk, you know, we kind of need a, a, I think of it as sort of a unified theory of the best flow regime that we can have in the rivers to, for maintenance of ecosystems. My goal and our goal is really to understand what is most likely to happen as best we can and then work with the, the survey and others on developing management strategies, policies, changes that we can implement that will sort of mitigate maybe the worst aspects.